For most of history, the Arctic Circle has been seen as the final frontier, a place so cold, so remote, that only the hardiest humans could survive. For decades, we thought we knew who those early Arctic pioneers were, the ancestors of the Inuit migrating eastward across Alaska and into the Canadian north. But what if that's not the full story? What if the Arctic's earliest settlers weren't the Inuit's ancestors at all, but an entirely different people whose genetic traces vanished from the modern map? And how did their legacy survive in the genes of modern Arctic people, or did it? Before we start, I'm on a road to get 1,000 subscribers as a small channel. If you want to help me, please subscribe. For much of the 20th century, archaeologists and historians shared a fairly straightforward view of Arctic settlement. According to this model, the Arctic was inhabited relatively late in human history, and the people who ultimately mastered its harsh climate were the ancestors of today's Inuit. These ancestors are usually identified with the Thule culture, which emerged in Alaska around 1000 CE and rapidly spread eastward across the Canadian Arctic and into Greenland. The Thule were technologically advanced for their time, using dog sleds, large open-water hunting boats called umiaks, and sophisticated tools made from bone, ivory and stone. As they expanded, they are thought to have replaced an earlier, less technologically equipped group known as the Dorset culture. The assumption was that the Thule gradually absorbed or outcompeted the Dorsets, and that this single migratory wave gave rise to all modern Inuit populations. But ancient DNA has revealed that this tidy narrative may have left out a crucial piece of the puzzle. As archaeologists dug deeper into Arctic prehistory, they began noticing inconsistencies that didn't quite align with the single origin model. Some of the oldest sites, like Sakak in Greenland and Denby in Alaska, revealed tools, dwellings and lifestyle patterns that were drastically different from those used by the later Thule Inuit. These early Arctic cultures relied heavily on small game hunting and caribou, used microblades instead of large harpoons and built smaller, more temporary structures. Even their art and personal ornaments had a different style. The Dorset people, who occupied much of the Arctic from around 500 BCE to 1500 CE, also had no clear signs of interaction with the Thule. Their housing, hunting methods and spiritual artifacts, like carved masks and animal figurines, were completely distinct. These differences led some researchers to propose that these cultures might not just be separate phases in one lineage, but instead belong to entirely different populations. Still, without genetic evidence, these ideas remained speculative. The real breakthrough came when scientists successfully extracted ancient DNA from a 4000-year-old hair sample found at the Sakak site in western Greenland. When the genome was sequenced, it shocked researchers. The man's DNA was unlike that of modern Inuit or any Native American group previously studied. Instead, he represented an entirely separate branch of humanity, one that had split from the ancestors of Native Americans more than 20,000 years ago. These early Arctic settlers, now called Paleo-Eskimos, had come into the region thousands of years before the Thule and had thrived across Alaska, Canada and Greenland for millennia. But here's the kicker. When the Thule arrived around 1000 CE, the genetic record shows no sign of interbreeding with the Paleo-Eskimos. It was as if one people had vanished entirely, replaced by another. This was not just a cultural transition, it was a complete population turnover, revealing that the Arctic had hosted not one, but multiple distinct human migrations. With the discovery of Paleo-Eskimo DNA, the picture of Arctic settlement began to shift dramatically. Rather than a single migratory wave from Alaska, geneticists now believe there were at least three major population movements into the Arctic. First came the Paleo-Eskimos, arriving around 5,000 years ago from Siberia and spreading eastward across the Arctic. They were genetically distinct from both Native Americans and the later Inuit. Next came the Thule, who entered Alaska around 1,000 CE, equipped with advanced technologies like dog sleds and large skin boats which allowed them to rapidly expand across the Arctic and into Greenland. The third group included the Athabascan-speaking peoples of the subarctic, who may have arrived during a separate migration linked to Neidine speakers from Central Asia. These overlapping waves of migration demonstrate that Arctic prehistory was far more dynamic than once believed. 
It wasn't a slow march northward by one people, it was a theatre of multiple arrivals, replacements and disappearances. One of the most haunting mysteries in Arctic history is the disappearance of the Paleo-Eskimos. After thousands of years of survival in some of the harshest conditions on Earth, they vanished from the archaeological and genetic record within a few centuries of the Thule arrival. The DNA tells a clear story. There was no interbreeding between the Paleo-Eskimos and the incoming Thule populations. Unlike other historical examples where migration leads to blending and exchange, the Thule appear to have entirely replaced the earlier inhabitants. Researchers believe multiple factors may have contributed. Climate shifts that disrupted traditional hunting grounds, resource competition with the more technologically advanced Thule, or perhaps disease and social fragmentation. Whatever the cause, the Paleo-Eskimos left no direct descendants among today's Inuit. Their complete genetic disappearance makes them one of the few ancient populations known to be fully replaced. They are, in a way, ghosts of the Arctic, present in history but absent from living DNA. The story of the Paleo-Eskimos and Thule isn't just about genetics. It's also about how deeply cultural identities can define and divide. Archaeological evidence shows that these two populations lived in the same geographic zones at different times, yet their technologies, art, architecture and seasonal movements were entirely different. The Thule built large semi-subterranean houses and hunted whales with advanced harpoons, while the Paleo-Eskimos favoured smaller dwellings and relied on caribou and small game. There's no sign of shared rituals, intermarriage or hybrid tools. These differences suggest not just isolated evolution, but a cultural boundary that was never crossed. Uniparental markers like mitochondrial DNA and Y-chromosome DNA provide another layer of evidence for this stark population divide. The Sakak man's mtDNA belonged to haplogroup D2A1, a lineage rarely found in modern Arctic populations. Meanwhile, Inuit groups typically carry haplogroups A2A and D4E1, and their Y chromosomes fall into different subbranches than those of Paleo-Eskimos. This separation in maternal and paternal lineages reinforces what genome-wide data already suggests. These populations were not closely related and did not mix. Instead, they occupied the Arctic at different times and vanished or replaced one another without blending their family lines. The combined evidence from ancient DNA, archaeological sites and cultural artefacts paints a very different picture of Arctic human history than we once believed. Rather than a simple story of one group adapting and evolving in place, the Arctic was home to multiple distinct populations, each with their own origins, technologies and lifestyles. The Paleo-Eskimos arrived first, thrived in isolation for thousands of years, and then vanished without passing on their genes. The Thule, ancestors of today's Inuit, were later arrivals who brought entirely new lifeways and rapidly spread across the region. This wasn't just a cultural shift, it was a replacement. The Arctic, long seen as a marginal and unchanging frontier, turns out to have been a dynamic and contested space where entire peoples rose and fell. It reminds us that even in the coldest, most remote corners of the planet, human history is as complex, layered and surprising as anywhere else. While ancient DNA has already transformed our understanding of the Arctic's past, it's clear that many questions remain. Researchers are now seeking ancient remains from earlier periods and broader regions, including Siberia, Arctic Russia and the Bering Strait, to trace the full path of the Paleo-Eskimos. Were there multiple subgroups among them? Did any of their genes survive in more isolated modern populations? And how did changing climates shape their rise and fall? Future excavations, especially in less explored Arctic zones, may hold the key. The Arctic still guards many of its secrets beneath permafrost and ice. But the DNA is beginning to speak. The Arctic Circle's human story has turned out to be far richer and more surprising than we once believed. Far from being shaped by a single group of hardy explorers, it was home to entire peoples who have since vanished, not only from the landscape but from the very DNA of those who came after. The Paleo-Eskimos, once masters of the North, are now remembered only through bones, tools and sequenced genomes. Their disappearance forces us to ask how many other forgotten migrations lie buried in the ice and earth. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoyed this journey into the past, would you consider subscribing?